I'm, we're continuing in this series on how to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And uh, I'm praying that God would do some mighty things here this morning. Amen? That He would uh, pour out His Spirit among us. Uh, Ephesians 5.18, which has been kind of our theme verse uh, throughout this series, is the command that Paul gives to that church at Ephesus. He says in 5 verse 18, And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with with the Holy Spirit. So as we begin this time, I want to just, once again, with grateful hearts, but also with a heart of asking, Lord, would you come and would you fill us today? Let's pray and offer this before the Lord. Lord, we humble ourselves before you. We thank you for your presence among us. We thank you that you are present here. You are present in all the churches around this world where your people are gathered. Lord, you are in the midst. And so, Lord, we trust that you are here and that you are faithful, and we trust that you will be faithful to each person that looks to you and leans into you. Holy Spirit, would you come and would you move mightily in our midst? Jesus, would you be praised? Would you be exalted? And would you be enthroned on our praises this morning? Jesus, would you have the center stage? Jesus, the spotlight is on you today, as as it is every day. Lord Jesus, we worship you. Would you be praised in this time? In your name we pray, amen. Well, over the last few weeks, we have covered a lot of ground on this subject of being filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, We just read Ephesians 5.18 and this command to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Another way of saying it is that this is not something that we would automatically do. When God commands something, He says, this is something you must seek after. In other words, it isn't automatic. We must press in and ask that the Lord would fill us. And while the Holy Spirit indwells every believer at salvation, not every believer is filled. And being filled is something that not should, not should just happen at one particular time, but we must continually be filled with the Holy Ghost. This verb tense there in that verse, as I've explained before, is this idea of be being filled with the Holy Spirit. I've given the illustration before of kind of like a, a sailboat trying to make it across the lake. This idea of the Holy Spirit is the wind in the sails. Well, the, the, the boat is not going to make it across the lake unless there's continual wind to be able to blow through the sails. And so I don't know what you're experiencing these days in your life, and praise the Lord for the things He's done in your life in the past. And if you've been filled with the Holy Spirit in the past, praise the Lord. But the question I have for each of us is, are you filled today? Is the Spirit of God filled your life? And all of us need this dynamite power, this Greek word, this dudamis, this dynamite power. In other words, are we exploding with the power of Jesus Christ in our lives? And we must not just simply be open to being filled with the Holy Spirit, but as as we see in Ephesians 5.18, we must eagerly desire to be filled because we are commanded to be as Christians. We are to pursue this. Why? Well, as we talked about several weeks ago, because when we are filled, the Holy Spirit will produce many different things within us. The, the, the evidences of the Holy Spirit will affect our speech. He will affect our singing. He will affect our attitude. He will affect our conduct and our relationships with one another. And for those of you that missed any of the last few weeks of the messages that I've given, I would encourage you, those of you even online, to go back and listen to the things that we've been talking about. But there are definitive evidences that one's life has been filled with the Holy Spirit, and we will know that we have been filled. You know, oftentimes if you were to talk to a person and ask them the question, are you saved or are you born again? And if they were to answer you, well, I think so or I hope so, uh, in my mind, that would lead a little bit of a red flag. Actually, would have a big red flag because if you have been born again, you would know because there is evidence in your spirit that you are a child of God. The Holy Spirit, He bears witness that you are born again. The same question I would ask you here this morning, have you been filled with the Holy Spirit? If you were to answer, well, I think so, or I hope so, 
Again, I would question the validity of this. My point is this. Just as people can be self-deceived as to being born again when they are not, so people can be self-deceived regarding being filled with the Holy Spirit when they are not. There can be deception in this way. And so we must examine our hearts and minds and say, am I really truly filled with the Spirit of Jesus in my life? Is my life exploding with the power of God in my life? Is this affecting my family? In other words, if you were to ask my spouse or you were to ask my kids or my neighborhood or my friends or my coworkers that there's something different in you, they would be able to say, they might not be able to say specifically what it is, but they would sense there's a difference. There will be evidences in one's life that we have been filled with the Holy Spirit. And I would think one of the greatest strategies of Satan today is to deceive people to think that they've experienced the height, the depth, the breadth and the, of all the goodness and grace of God when there's so much more that God has for us. Amen. Have you been filled with the Holy Spirit? My prayer is that we would all, with definitive hearts and witness in our spirit to say yes, I am full of the Holy Spirit to the praise of Jesus. Because when we are filled with the Holy Spirit, we will know it. And others will see a difference in us as well. There will be a witness in our spirit that the Holy Spirit has full governance in our lives. You know, last week I shared with you the first two requirements that God has for us before we can be filled with the Holy Spirit. First of all, we talked about that we must be born again, that we must be followers of Jesus Christ, not just in pretense, not just come to a a knowledge of the Word of God, and certainly we must have that knowledge by the grace of God, but we must come to a place of full surrender. We must come to that place of full obedience to Jesus, that He becomes the Lord of our life, that Jesus, you have the steering wheel, as it will, as, as it were. Jesus, you are the Lord of my life. And so once again, we need to examine whether or not we truly are born again. And we're thankful for the number of hands that were raised last week to come to Christ by the grace of God. The second thing we must remember as far as being filled with the Holy Spirit is that we must crucify our flesh. The flesh is in opposition to the things of the Spirit. That we must reckon ourselves as dead to sin and alive to Christ Jesus. That we must crucify our flesh. That we must not pull up off the nails as we talked about last week and try to prolong the cross, but we must submit to the cross in our lives. Submit to that, come to that place of submission to the will of God and say, Lord, not I who live, but Christ who lives through me and for me. And so we must be crucified to our flesh. And the truth is, as we see in the life of Jesus Christ, is before resurrection life and power can happen, there must be a death, a certain death to self. And this is something we must be reminded of once again here this morning. I'm going to kind of circle back to that point uh, later in this morning's message. But today, what I would like to do is give us the last three things that God desires of us in order for us to truly be filled with the Holy Spirit. I've given you the first two the last week. This morning, I want to begin with point number three. What God requires of us, if we are going to be filled with the Holy Spirit, is we must dedicate ourselves to God completely and absolutely. We must dedicate ourselves to God completely and absolutely. Paul says in Romans 12, 1 and 2, I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your spiritual act of worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by the testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. We must present our bodies to God. Friends, never take your body any place you wouldn't take Jesus. 
that we must submit our bodies to the living God because we are temples of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, we cannot commit our bodies to sexual immorality. We cannot commit our bodies to looking at things and listening to things that grieve His Holy Spirit. We are temples of the Holy Spirit. You think about in the Old Testament as we covered the tabernacle and we saw the images and, and all the symbolism, how it points to Jesus and how, how God visited his people as the people did what God had commanded according to the Old Testament law. Friends, as Christians, Jesus now indwells us that we are tabernacles of the Holy Spirit. That as we go about our business every day, wherever we park the ark, so to speak, wherever we go about our business, Jesus desires to manifest himself in us and through us to be a witness to this world. We must not use our bodies or do anything that would grieve the Holy Spirit. And frankly, all of us have been guilty. We have all fallen short of God's perfect standard, but yet this is a place where we must come to, this place of true repentance and this true place of saying, God, I give you myself, I give you my body, I give you my hands, I give you my feet, I give you my mouth and my mind and my heart. I give everything to you and I'm not going to hold anything back. We must give it all to God. Some of you, God may be calling into ministry, some of you maybe have sensed a calling of God in your life, maybe something that you perceived years ago, but you pushed it aside, or you've been kind of sticking to something else, and you've kind of been you know, d- distracted by other things. As you are filled with the Spirit of God, God will continue to birth and rebirth His passion and His calling for your life, that you would become a channel by which His grace and can flow through you know you think of the soundboard if you have an old soundboard if you check the channels the certain channels may be dead some may not work but if you can find one channel that works sound can go through that channel so that people can hear and i think as we come to this place of full surrender to jesus christ we say lord jesus i want to be a channel by which you can use i want to be a channel by which the spirit of god can work through my life that he can speak through me that he can live through me that jesus would be praised and that your kingdom god would come and that your will would be done lord let it happen in me god may we be a channel by which your spirit can work through and move through Are you open to what God may do in your life? If you come to this place and say, I don't know if I want to really surrender to God because I fear that if God really gets a hold of my life that he's going to call me to be a missionary in a place like Ukraine. (laughs) Or he's going to call me to be a, a missionary or do something that would be naturally uneasy for me to do. I want to say this, just speaking from my life, I was terrified of speaking in front of people when I was a kid. I used to come up in the classroom and tremble reading a paper and tears would flow down my face and the kids would all start laughing at me. And then so I was so embarrassed and then this happened time after time after time when I was a kid. And so I was afraid to speak in front of people and so the thought of being a pastor or going to ministry, that was the last thing on my mind. Why would I want to make a fool for myself and have be embarrassed in front of people? But Jesus had to break me in my flesh. He had to break me in my pride. He had to bring me to that place of full surrender. And it took me four years when I was in college to come to that place of true surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ where I say, Lord, if anybody's going to get anything from my life, let it be you, not me. I'm not preaching myself. I'm not trying to promote myself. I'm trying to promote you. Jesus, would you be exalted? Friends, if you will give Jesus your weakness, God's strength will be perfected through it. One of the things I've discovered about God is he's attracted to weakness. He's attracted to it. God works through weakness. And so as we surrender to God and we say, God, I give you my weaknesses and my strengths, but sometimes we find out that we're strongest when we're weakest and weakest when we're strongest. When we come to that place where we say, Jesus, I want to submit to you everything. I want you to be the Lord of my life. God will get a hold of us and transform us. Are you willing to say, Jesus, I dedicate myself to you completely? Are you open to what God would call you to do and to be? 
Maybe the Lord isn't calling you to be a missionary in Ukraine. Maybe He is calling you to support somebody who is. Maybe God is calling you to be the best mother or father or friend or co-worker. That He desires to be, you, you to be a channel by which His grace and power can flow through so that other people will come to faith in Jesus Christ. As we've talked about over the last few weeks, the purpose of being filled with the Spirit of God is that we can fulfill the mission of God in this world. That we can be a witness to the people around us. Jesus says, and you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses to Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Somehow we've separated this call to be filled with the Holy Spirit from the mission of God. But God is saying, look, if you want to fulfill my mission, there's no other way for it to be accomplished except by being filled with my Spirit. The devil has done everything he can to make us afraid of this because he thinks he's going to, he's going to think we're going to be a nut, a fruit, or a flake. Kind of a bowl of granola Christian, you know? But as we say, Jesus, I want you to be the Lord of my life. There's nothing more beautiful that can happen when he transforms us. God desires our absolute, unconditional surrender. A.W. Tozer said it this way. He said, we should pray for God to invade and conquer us, for until he does, we remain in peril from a thousand foes. We bear within us the seeds of our own disintegration. The strength of our flesh is an ever-present danger to our souls. Deliverance can come to us only by the defeat of our old life. Safety and peace come only after we have been forced to our knees. God rescues us by breaking us by shattering our strength and wiping out our resistance. Then he invades our natures with that ancient and eternal life, which is from the beginning. So he conquers us, and by that conquest, he saves us for himself. I agree with him. God desires to conquer us. And the reason why many of us cannot be filled even today is because our flesh is so alive, and we have all of our excuses, and we try to resist, and our flesh... God is calling us to crucify our flesh and come to that place of full surrender. And this is where most of us and many of us fall short because we have our reservations. We hold back. We resist. We pull up off the nails. Or worse yet, we climb off the cross. We want control. God's saying, no, I don't fill vessels who want control of their lives. I only fill vessels that surrender everything. That lay everything down. That submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. We want control, but God is saying, no, that's not how it works. I cannot fill vessels that are already full of themselves. I can only fill vessels that are empty of their flesh and open to the working of the Holy Spirit. And I want to say as well, the cross is rough. It is deadly, but it is effective. The cross does not keep us hanging there forever, praise the Lord. (laughs) There is resurrection. There is resurrection life. As we dedicate ourselves to God, as we crucify our flesh, as we say, Lord, not I who live, but Christ through me, as we surrender ourselves and yield ourselves to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, as we crucify our flesh and dedicate ourselves unto the Lord and say, God, you have free reign in me, God will do marvelous things. We must dedicate ourselves to God completely and absolutely. That's point number three. The fourth thing that God requires of us if we are going to be filled with His Holy Spirit is we must earnestly desire to be filled. We must earnestly desire to be filled. You know, some of us have this kind of perception, well, I'm just doing fine already. Really? Really? I mean, you know, we go about our business and we just kind of, you know, live as we want to live. I want to say this. We need to be infused with the life of Jesus Christ. You know, maybe you're walking very close with Jesus right now. Maybe you're getting into his presence regularly. The one thing I've discovered is the more I get in the presence of the Lord, the more I desire to be filled with more of him. 
I desire more of his presence. I've tasted and seen the goodness of God, and this is why I want more. This is why I want to see God high and lifted up in my life. But once again, I must desire this, and you must as well. You know, I want to read Luke chapter 11, verses 9 through 13. Jesus says this, And I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it will be open. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead give instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Have you asked God to fill you with his spirit? Yes, we're all indwelt if we're born again. But are we really filled with the power of Jesus? You know, it was in August of 1993, just a few weeks before I was to graduate, or before my senior year in high school. That August, I was living in Michigan with my family, and I went out to Pennsylvania to uh, visit my grandparents. That's where they lived in western Pennsylvania, just north of of Pittsburgh, not too far from Butler. And uh, they had a neighbor of theirs who's a second cousin of mine named Leroy. And I, of course, being just ready to enter into my senior year of high school, Leroy uh, was always somebody that I looked up to. He was just uh, not only an adventurous and fun guy, he was married with several kids, about 10, 15 years older than me, but I just loved being around Leroy. And Leroy was on fire for Jesus. There was just something about his life that was infectious. He just just was full of Jesus. And Leroy asked me, along with my other cousin, Stephen, he said, would you guys like to go with me on a camping trip up in the Allegheny National Forest? And of course, I was thrilled, the fact that I could hang out with Leroy for the weekend and and just be with him and have this adventure, just the three of us. I'd never really done much camping as a kid, and so the thought of being able to go on this trip was greatly appealing to me. So I, I told Leroy, yes. And he said, well, I have all the equipment. I have the backpacks. I have everything available. I got all the water purifiers. I got all the things. He gave us a few things that we needed to purchase on our own. But we, the three of us, were going to go out to Allegheny National Forest to Minister Creek up there. And I remember that weekend as we went, the weather was absolutely gorgeous and we had a great time Friday night just hanging out and just goofing around as the three of us guys. And and that Saturday we hiked a little bit more, we probably went maybe 15 miles or so, so it wasn't too laborious, but it it was an adventure nonetheless. And finally that Saturday night as we had that campfire underneath the stars, and you could just see, I don't know if you've ever been out in the wilderness like that, but you can just see a whole canopy of stars, you know, without all the interference of all the city lights. It was just beautiful to see the majesty of God in his creation. And Leroy sat us down, and we were sitting around the campfire, and he said, boys, he said, have you been filled with the Holy Spirit? And I didn't really know fully what that had meant, God had been stirring in my life for about a year or two prior to this. Uh, I began uh, desiring to be, you know, know Jesus, and my grandparents had actually been sending me some cassette tapes. Yes, cassette tapes. (laughs) Shows how old I am. Cassette tapes from sermons that their pastor had given out, and so I was listening to those sermons and, and trying to understand what it meant to follow the Lord. But I didn't really fully know when Leroy asked me that question what that meant. It was a bolt of lightning going to come from heaven and I was going to start rolling on the ground and speaking in tongues and all these things. And I, I, I didn't fully know what that meant. But I did know this. I was hungry for Jesus. I desired to want to have God have, have all my, my whole body, my life. I was still, yes, terrified to speak in front of people, but ministry wasn't even on the radar then. I was thinking about architecture. And so I was just saying, you know, Lee Wright, yes, I do want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And so he got on his knee. I was just sitting there in the chair, and he just laid his hands on my head, and he said, Tim, 
I'm going to pray that you just be filled with the Holy Spirit. And I want to just confess to you, in that moment, there was no bolt of lightning. I didn't start immediately rolling on the ground or speaking in tongues in that moment. But I sensed the presence of Jesus. And I sensed something happening in me in that moment that I wanted to give Jesus everything. And Leroy prayed for my other cousin Stephen as well, and we went home and we had a great time that, the rest of that weekend and we went home. But you know, it's interesting, as I went back to my, my senior year in high school, God began wor- working at warp speed, not to say he wasn't working before that at warp speed, but I began seeing God doing some incredible things in my life. I began seeking him like never before. I desired and hungered for his word like never before. I wanted to know Jesus and I wanted to tell others about Jesus. We started a Bible study with other guys and one of my friends, Chad, came to this Bible study and God got a hold of his life and a few weeks later he died in a car accident. And God began doing incredible things and he he started showing up. And as I began going into my bedroom each night to seek the Lord and began to seek the face of Jesus, the presence of God came in my life and I began to know Jesus. And yes, there was time, and that I remember one particular time, again, praising the Lord, and this glorious language began coming out as I worshiped the Lord, and I began speaking in tongues. And as I've said before, as I shared several weeks ago, tongues is an evidence of being filled with the Holy Spirit, not the evidence. I believe that the Spirit of God works in many different ways in our lives, but God got a hold of me. That's the point. So often we get hung up on things. Because we're afraid that things will turn into a circus. And I don't want a circus any more than you, but I do want things of God. And I do know that God's ways are above our ways. And if we try to program everything and try to control everything by our own flesh, we will miss the Spirit of God in our midst. You know, the Gospel of John, I want to read to you in John chapter 7, something that is marvelous of what is said here in John 7. Verses 37 through 39 says this. He says, On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now he said this about the Spirit. He says this about the Holy Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Now I realize this was a time before Jesus was to be raised and Jesus was yet to be glorified. But friends, what Jesus is talking about is that he desires each of us to be channels by which his grace and power can flow through. That we become a river of of God. That we get in the river and are out of us By God's grace, the Spirit of God will produce a river in us that we desire to flow in the ways of God. I long for this river of living water. And the Holy Spirit will produce that in each of us. We will find refreshment and nourishment for our souls. I'm talking to somebody here today that is tired. I'm talking to somebody here that is emotionally worn out. That you are at the end of yourself. And yes, you've been praying for a change in your circumstance, and I would encourage you to keep praying. But what we need most of all is to be infused with the life of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit. And that God doesn't always change our circumstances, He changes us. And when we come to the place where we say, Lord, not I anymore, but Christ through me, can the Holy Spirit work and give us new perspective on the pain that we've experienced We find refreshment for our souls. You know, Isaiah 44, 3 says, For I will pour water on thirsty land and streams on dry ground. I will pour my spirit on your offspring and my blessings on your descendants. I'm not just talking to adults here. I'm talking to teenagers. I'm talking to children. If if you've given Jesus your life, you are a candidate to be filled with the Spirit of Christ. Not just to be indwelt with the Spirit, but to be infused with His life and His power. The question I have is, do you thirst for the springs of life that the Holy Spirit gives? Many of us are contented to live without this. We've been inoculated against the real thing.
God is looking for people who will seek Him. He's looking and He's moving by His Spirit, through, roaming throughout the earth, and He's looking for people who will worship Him in spirit and in truth. Not just people that seek Him. And again, I want to make clear, we're not seeking experiences. We're seeking Jesus. We're seeking Christ Jesus. And when we seek Jesus, He will do with us what He desires to do. But we must seek Him with the right motives and make sure that we're coming with, uh, uh, before Him with a pure heart. Ari Tori said it this way, it is not enough that the desire for the filling of the Holy Spirit to be intense, it must also have the right motive. There is a desire to be filled that is purely selfish. There are many who have an intense desire for the baptism of the Holy Spirit simply that He may be a great preacher or a great personal worker or renowned in some way as a Christian. It is simply his own gain of glory that he is seeking. After all, it is not the Holy Spirit in whom he is seeking, but his own honor and the filling of the Holy Spirit is simply a means to that end. There's something there that we need to grasp a hold of. If your desire to be filled with the Holy Spirit is to be recognized, to be honored by people, you are coming with the wrong motive. Our desire is to see Jesus increase and that we decrease, that he is the Lord of our life. I want to read a story, and this is a sobering story in Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8, verses 14 through 24 says this. Now when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for he had not fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them, one way in which the Holy Spirit can come and fill our lives through the laying on of hands, and they received the Spirit. Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, so that anyone whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this manner, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours, and pray the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven. For I see you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. And Simon answered, Pray for me to the Lord, that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. You see, Simon, when he saw God working mightily through the apostles' hands and people were being filled with the Holy Spirit, he had a strong desire for this power of the Holy Spirit, but it was entirely selfish. He wanted to be able to do the things the apostles did and to make a name for himself, to become great and to become recognized. But you see, just as he was misguided in his own approach, many of us are misguided. We think that, well, if I can get this power, then I'll you know, be recognized by other people. And yes, maybe ministry will explode, but friends, if, you're, if your heart is in the wrong place, your ministry won't explode because you're doing it out of a selfish heart. Listen, I, I want you to set, as much as we desire to be used in ministry and however God chooses to use us, what God wants for, from us is that we would be that channel To say, Jesus, what I want is you. What I want is your name to be glorified. I want you to be exalted. You know, you think about Jesus as he was uh, getting ready to be crucified. And, and of course, he tells the disciples, I want you to go into town and you'll find a man there. And he's going to have a donkey there as you you, you get this donkey. And tell him that the Lord has need of this donkey or this colt. And, of course... He had this word of knowledge to be able to understand what would happen. And the disciples did, and they went to this particular street and this particular house, and they told the man, look, uh, the, the Lord has need of your cult. And what surprises me and amazes me is the man just said, okay, here you go. But it's interesting, as Jesus rode into town on that Palm Sunday on that cult, the people were waving their palm branches, and they were laying down their cloaks before Jesus. And likewise, if we are filled with the Holy Spirit, in some ways we become like that cult. And there may be people that would wave their branches and lay their cloaks down in front of you, but don't be foolish enough to think they're doing it because of you. Look who's sitting on you. 
Look who's sitting on it. We do this not by the power of our own strength or our own flesh. We lift up the lordship of Jesus Christ. I'm just the dumb colt on the bottom. (laughs) What's your motive? What's your motive? Is it to build a name for yourself? Or is it to lift up Jesus? Why do you seek to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Is it for selfish motive? Is it for recognition? Is it for acclaim? Or is it to know and honor Jesus Christ? To be useful for Him. To be a tool in His hands. You know, A.B. Simpson, the founder of the Alliance, he said this, There's no truth that needs to be more emphasized in this age of smartness and human self-sufficiency than the imperative necessity of the baptism of the Holy Spirit as the condition of all effective Christian work. I agree with him. Jesus has set us on mission in this world. Jesus has called us to be a light. He said the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. What Jesus calls and desires from us is that we not only become a worker in his fields, but we become submitted to his will in in our lives, that we become a tool in his hands by which his grace and power can flow through, that we can become his vessels that are fit for his use. We must not only desire to be filled. Number four, we must ask him to do it. The fifth and final requirement of being filled with the Holy Spirit is that we must obey. Acts 5.32 says, And we are witnesses to these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey Him. Some of us coming to that place of surrender, we can lift our hands and say, you know, Pastor Tim, I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, but I don't really want any changes in my life. I want to say that that's an impossible thing. When the Holy Spirit gets a hold of your life, there will be changes. He'll rearrange some things in your life, and He'll bring everything under the lordship of our sovereign God. Whatever God is asking you to do, do it. A.B. Simpson said, let your whole being receive the baptism of His presence. You know, God is working in each of our lives uniquely. I'm not foolish enough to think that this is a cookie-cutter church, or that we have cookie-cutter lives, that how God worked in my life is exactly the same way that He's working in your life. And that's the beauty of God's creation. That's the beauty of His design, that we are all uniquely fashioned according to His purposes. That God made you and me a 10 out of 10 for the job when He created us. God works uniquely in our lives. And so often, many people who preach on this subject matter, they preach it as if God works the same way in everyone's lives. No, He doesn't. You know, you look in the Scriptures and you see that Jesus healed people differently. There were times where He touched people physically. There were times where other people touched Him or maybe just touched the fringe or the hem of His garment. Interestingly enough, it talks about, and the prophet says, He shall arise with healing in His wings. The wings is the fringe of a garment. People knew that if they could just touch the fringe or the wing of his garment, there's healing in his wings. Sometimes others touched the hem of his garment. Other times, Jesus just spoke the word, and they were miles apart. You think about the centurion servant, and that man was instant, that young man was instantly healed because Jesus spoke the word. No, one case, Jesus took from the mud and, and spit in it and, and formed this man's eye. Out of the, scripture says, out of the dust he forms us. I believe this man wasn't just blind, he didn't even have an eye. Jesus just formed it out of the dust and made an eye. God works uniquely, and he's done this, and Jesus healed people differently. Why did he do this? I believe Jesus healed people differently so that we wouldn't fall in love with the pattern but the person of Jesus Christ. That we wouldn't fall in love with the methodology but we would fall in love with the messenger, Jesus Christ. And this is also true to being filled with the Holy Spirit. God uniquely works in each of us. 
I mentioned there in Acts chapter 8, verse 17, where the Christian, where they, they were the Samaritans there, the disciples, they saw the apostles, and the apostles laid their hands on them, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. We also see Timothy in 1 Timothy 4:14. 4, the elders laid their hands on him, and he was given a gift of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes this gift is given through the laying on of hands. Sometimes we just stand and receive what God has for us as we call out to Him and surrender completely. Sometimes it's a matter of bowing or kneeling or prostrating ourselves before the living God. And it can happen at any time and any place. It can happen here at church as we gather together. It can happen at home. It can happen in the middle of a forest. But God works uniquely. And so as we gather together this morning, I'm not foolish enough to think that we're just a cookie-cutter congregation, that God is working it's the same way in each of our lives. But the point is this, are you open to receiving what God has for you? Are you willing to crucify yourself and your flesh and to say, Jesus, I dedicate myself to you wherever you would take me. Whatever you would call me to do, I'll do it by your grace that I might be a light to the nations and I might be a witness to the world. I give you my weakness, let your strength be perfected in it. And when you give God your weakness, God is saying, now I can use something because you're, you've surrendered it to me. If you've given me the reins of that in your life. You know, I'm not interested in formulating a pattern for our reception here this morning. But I'm calling us, and I believe the Spirit of God is calling us to fall in love with the person of Jesus Christ. To fall in love with Christ Jesus. You know, the whole, one of the true signs of something is of the Holy Spirit is it will always point people to Jesus. It will always, the Holy Spirit, He will testify of who Jesus is. He doesn't point us to people or try to glorify human beings. He points people to Jesus. However God chooses the work, in each of our lives, I do believe the requirements are the same. Those five things, I want to give them rather quick. If you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, what God requires of you is, number one, you must be born again. Number two, you must crucify your flesh. Number three, you must dedicate yourself completely to God. Number four, you must ask and desire and seek Him to fill you. And finally, whatever God is calling you to do, you must obey. You know, friends, we don't have to persuade God. God already desires this more than us because He's commanded us to be filled. But He is persuading us through His Word that we must be filled. If there's any deficiency, it's not on God's part to give. It's on our part to receive. And God will not fill us with Himself if we are full of ourselves. To be indwelt with the Spirit at salvation is a marvelous thing where we possess the Holy Spirit. But when we are filled with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit possesses us. If being filled with the Holy Spirit means anything to us, it should bring us to the death of the ordinary. Remember, it's not so much, Lord, give me more of you, but rather, Lord, take more of me. Because God does not surrender to us, we surrender to Him. And my challenge for us this morning is to seek the Lord and to not quit, to be passionate in our approach. You know, there was a blind man, blind Bartimaeus, he saw Jesus was passing by. He said, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And the religious crowd were around this blind man. said, oh, don't, don't bother Jesus. You need to just, just quiet down. And he shouted all the louder, Jesus, son of David, have mercy upon me. And Jesus came to him and he touched him. You know, this man was willing to defy the conventional standards of the day, the religious crowd. And he was willing to be passionate in his pursuit after God. And that draws the attention of Jesus. To be passionate in our pursuit must also mean that we maintain reverence for Jesus Christ. 
You know, I don't know how the Holy Spirit is going to work in these next few moments. I do know this. I can't do anything. And really, God is looking at the condition of your heart today and asking you, do you really want to be filled? You know, you may be filled instantaneously today, and I praise the Lord, and I'm asking that He would do that in our lives. It may happen in the near future, but don't quit and keep asking. Press into the Lord and be persistent. You know, today as we close the service, in these next few moments, I want to really just be laser-focused as we worship the Lord together. We're going to worship Jesus. And I want to pray as we gather together here in closing, and I believe it's God's desire in us that we would turn this place into an altar. An altar before the living God. We're going to focus vertically in these times, not horizontally. We're going to focus our attention on Jesus. And as I shared last week, and I want to reiterate today, if there's any unresolved conflict that you have with God, get it right. Repent. No more closets anymore. You may have questions. You may not be certain of why God allowed certain circumstances in your life. I don't have those answers for you this morning, but I do know this. God is inviting you to trust Him. He's inviting you to give Him the the reins of your life, the steering wheel, and to not pull up off the nails, though it's killing you inside. But let death have its final work in you so that his resurrection life and power can be manifested in you. That you become a channel by which he can work through and flow through. That that river of life would happen in you. Confess your sins before the Lord. Repent. I'm going to just invite you to stand to your feet here this morning. We're going to close by singing a couple songs. The first one is called, We Fall Down and Lay Our Crowns at the Feet of Jesus. And for some of us, we've been crowning our flesh our whole life where we say, you know what, I want to be recognized, I want to be honored, I want to be noticed by other people. And God is saying, look, I want you to lay that crown down. I want you to come to the feet of Jesus and humble yourself completely. Make yourself a burn offering that we would become an altar before the living God. So as we sing this song, maybe you need to just kneel at your, at, your, at your chair or come forward or lift your hands. I don't know what the Spirit of God is telling you to do, but you obey the Spirit and not your flesh. But hold nothing back before God today. Some of you are just kind of waiting and say, boy, I wonder what's going to happen. Look, the invitation is not to try to see what's going on around you. God is after you today. He's after you. He's not, you know, some of you may be thinking, well, I hope my grandson or granddaughter sees this message here today. Praise the Lord, maybe they do. But you need to hear it today. God is after you and he's after me. Will we lay our life down before Him? We're going to sing two songs in worship, and what we're going to do at the end of the service, we're going to, I'm going to dismiss the service after those two songs. But after that time of dismissing everybody, if you would like to be prayed for, one of the ways in Scripture says there's the laying on of hands. If you want to be just asking that God would fill you with the Holy Spirit, I can't give this to you. No other person can give this to you. Only Jesus can. But we are going to have a team of people available after the service this morning. For anybody that needs to get some business done with God, maybe you just need to fall on your face before the Lord and cry out to Him. I don't know what the Lord is leading you to do, but we want to make this place an altar of praise before Jesus. So let's come. Let's not be half-hearted in our praises before God. Let's be sincere and, and our desire before Him. You know, just several scriptures as I was reading this past week, Isaiah 42, 8 says, I am the Lord and that is my name. I will not yield my glory to another or my praise to idols. Some of us have need to lay down some idols. 
Isaiah 43, 18, forget the former things and do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing and making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. Isaiah 44, 3, for I will pour water on a thirsty land and streams on dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. Friends, if we are followers of Jesus Christ, we are the descendants of Abraham and the blessing of Jesus and the blessing of God rests on us. Let's come and lay our crowns before him in worship.